Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Dr. Jacob Haskalovici. I'm the Director of Pain Management for the Department of Neurology at Hackensack University Medical Center. And I'm an Associate Professor of Neurology at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine. I'm very excited to speak to you today. Uh, the topic of the lecture series is prescribing pain relief. And the topic of my section is introduction to chronic pain care. Following my talk, you will have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Jonathan Tu about uh, rehabilitation for chronic pain or for pain in general. So thank you very much. And I'll go ahead and get started. A uh, quick agenda for, my, for the section of my presentation today. I thought it would be helpful to answer some of the most common questions um, that I hear in my office, which is a pain management office. So some of the most common questions that I get are related to pain. Those questions are, first of all, what is pain? Uh, second, what is the difference between acute and chronic pain? Why does it feel like no one can figure out what is causing my pain? What causes pain in general? What types of treatments can be used to treat pain? And I'll end with, will my chronic pain ever go away? So getting started, what is pain? Have we ever stopped to ask ourselves, what is this strange sensation that we're experiencing? So the definition of pain, um, according to the International Association for the Study of Pain, is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And so what I'd like to point out here is that pain is unpleasant. It's both a feeling, a sensory experience, but also an emotional experience. And it is something that is associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So to clarify, pain is one of our senses. Much like smell, sight, taste, touch, and hearing, pain tells us, um, pain tells us about the inside workings of our body. Whereas the other senses, which I mentioned earlier, smell, sight, taste, those reflect what's happening on the outside world. So that gives us a little bit of flavor of what pain really is. It's telling us what's happening on the inside of our body. Furthermore, pain is a highly personal and unique experience that belongs to the individual who is experiencing it and no one else. What that means is practically, no one can tell the experiencer, the person who's suffering from pain, how they are experiencing those symptoms. And one of the things that I like to tell my patients is, does a banana taste like an orange if I tell you it does? Meaning, if I give you a banana and I say to you, what does this banana taste like? And you say to me, well, it tastes like a banana. Would it make any sense for me to say, no, it tastes like an orange to you? And I think that's a really important um, point about pain. No, um, no doctor or therapist or physician or family member can tell you how you are experiencing pain, the symptom. One of the things that I hear from my patients often is um, that they feel that their symptoms are dismissed or not taken seriously. And um, that really should not be the case because no uh, observer can tell the experiencer how they are feeling. The next point about pain, what it is, um, we know that pain affects the body of a person. If your knee hurts, there may be a problem in your knee. If your back hurts, there may be a problem in your back. But what's unspoken is that pain can also affect a person's mind and their social well-being. We, we don't always know what comes first, but what we do know is that if you are living in a state of pain that's constant, that can affect our mind and our mood and our motivations. And that's an important part of pain. One of the things that the studies teach us is that 
when you're thinking about the impact that pain has on a body, thinking about the body is only one third of the problem. We also need to consider how the symptom impacts a person's behavioral health and their mental health, but also their social well-being. Can, is the pain preventing them from doing their job, from cleaning their home, from being a good parent, from going to work? When they're in work, are they present or are they um, not present because their symptoms are interfering with their ability to think? And so when we think about managing pain, it really requires an approach that integrates all three of these elements, the body, the mind, and the social well-being of a person. And this is a picture that just illustrates some of the biological factors of pain, like genetics and chemistry and the health of our tissues, some of the psychological factors like depression and anxiety and anger, which can come with uh, feelings of pain, and of course the social factors, um, social support, social learning, socioeconomic status, uh, the ability to do things like work and take care of your friends and family, these all encompass the pain experience. Finally, pain is often invisible especially when pain lasts for a long time and it doesn't seem to be getting better or going away, it's often invisible. It, it's not something that an observer can see on a person and that can make a person feel very isolated. Some disabilities look like this, the top of my screen, wheelchairs and canes and crutches and walkers and casts, but some disabilities look like this. And that's a really important point about pain. You know, people who suffer from back pain, for example, and they're standing on a bus, right? Someone sitting down may not necessarily know to stand up and give them their seat. And that can be frustrating for the person who's suffering um, from the symptoms. And, you know, it's also difficult uh, to discuss chronic pain with an employer, for example, since often the symptoms are invisible. That conversation with your employer would be a lot different if you were in a wheelchair or on crutches, for example. And so these are some of the struggles that people who suffer from pain um, have to endure. The next question that I'd like to talk about is what is the difference between acute or chronic pain? How can I tell the difference? So acute pain, this is a very severe and intense pain, but it's usually also short-lived. So for example, when a person falls and injures themselves, there may be a strain of a bone or a, a sprain or a broken bone that typically gets better with time. This is the type of pain that's associated with trauma or surgery, for example. Um, there is an expected time within which the body should heal itself. And generally when that time passes, so does the pain um, itself resolve. Chronic pain though is a different experience entirely. This is continual and recurring pain. This is the kind of pain that doesn't seem to be getting better or going away. And it's pain that extends beyond the expected time frame within which we would expect the body to heal itself. So for example, a broken bone, we expect it to heal between somewhere in eight to 12 weeks. So any uh, persistent symptoms beyond this time period would be considered chronic pain. And when you're dealing with chronic pain, it really requires a different approach. This time frame in the literature is somewhere between three to six months. So if you are experiencing pain that doesn't seem to be getting better or going away beyond the sort of three to six month mark, that is an indication that you may be dealing with chronic pain and a good indication uh, to potentially see a specialist for that symptom. Am I alone? Why can't anyone figure out what is causing my pain? This is something that as a pain specialist, I hear often from my patients. And um, there's a few important points to bring out. Pain is um, cryptogenic, it's elusive, it's mysterious and sometimes difficult to kind of point a finger at and say that this is what's causing the pain. And that's why um, and individuals who suffer from chronic pain often struggle, struggle to find a diagnosis. Pain is highly personal. 
And it's very difficult to describe and remember. And so what often happens is a patient will come into my office and tell me, you know, I was dealing with these symptoms a while ago. I can't really fully remember them or I'm dealing with the symptoms now, but I can't find the right words to describe the symptoms. And giving your doctor an accurate description of the symptoms is often helpful in finding the cause of the pain. Um, so one of the things I recommend to my patients is when they're experiencing the symptoms to keep a journal and log the symptoms so that when they get to the doctor, they have some information to give to them. The next point is that the images and testing often don't tell the whole story. I often have patients who come into the office who have herniated discs and arthritis, for example, on their imaging, their x-rays and their MRIs, and they would like to know what is the prescribed treatment for these problems? And what I explain to them is that just because you have arthritis or herniated discs or disc disease or pinched nerves on an image, that doesn't necessarily correlate with your symptoms, with the way you are feeling. I often have patients who are not dealing with pain at all, but they would like an explanation on why they have all sorts of imaging findings. And the reason for that is some arthritis and some degenerative changes on the spine is a part of the normal aging process. And so if the symptoms and the images don't correlate, that can be confusing to uh, explain to a person and also give them a diagnosis. The next point is that pain can be multifactorial. It can come from a whole bunch of different places um, different tissue types and different um, underlying pathologies. It can become from arthritis, from muscle issues, from nerve issues. And so um, it's not always a simple bone problem or muscle problem or joint problem or nerve problem. Pain can change over time. What you experienced two years ago may not be the same um, symptoms that you're experiencing now and may be coming from a completely different part of the body. And finally, um, pain that's experienced in one part of the body can often affect others. Uh, pain can radiate. It can start in the neck and shoot down the arm. It can start in the back and shoot down the leg. And so you have to ask yourself, are you dealing with a spine problem or a leg problem or a little bit of both? And we can also see spreading. Sometimes people who have pain in one part of the body, what we'll see is the symptoms will spread to adjacent areas. So hip pain becomes knee pain and lower back pain. And then you have to try to figure out what is the generator of the pain. So all this said together, uh, these are one of the reasons why it can be difficult to figure out what's causing pain and why there's a significant benefit in really seeing a pain specialist. Next, what are some of the things that can cause pain? We touched on this briefly uh, in the previous slide, but just to reiterate, I generally think about pain coming from three major tissue types. Number one are the muscles. And these, that type of pain is often felt like squeezing, dull, pressure, tightness, and it can occur around the neck, shoulder blades, and lower back. There's bone and joint pain. This is often experienced as sharp, aching, stabbing pain. And again, neck, middle, lower back, hips, shoulders, knees, hands are often affected by joint pain. And then of course there's nerve pain, which can feel like burning, shooting, electrical sensation in the hands and feet or radiating from the neck to the arms or from the back to the legs. Um, so part of my job as a pain specialist is to talk to a person and figure out what are the most likely tissue types involved for my prescribed treatment. Next, what are some of the treatment options available to me? Um, when I think about prescribing treatments for chronic pain, I think about going from conservative therapies to more invasive therapies. And so some of the conservative sort of non-invasive, more um, sort of holistic uh, approach to the treatment of pain will involve physical therapy and rehabilitation, something that you'll hear about in the next section of this talk massage and chiropractic manipulations, things like acupuncture. These are treatments that are available. 
There are um, long lists of medications that are non-opioid based, meaning they do not come from families of narcotics or morphine or oxycodone. Um, those fall into sort of three major categories, some over-the-counter vitamins and minerals that can be used to help um, support joint muscle and nerve health, over-the-counter and prescription strength medicines like anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxers, nerve pain medications, and some antidepressants that can be used to treat pain. And then a long list of creams, both over-the-counter and prescription strength and patches that can be used locally to treat pain. And finally, uh, there are some interventional treatments, some injections and nerve blocks that can be done, like large joint injections with cortisone, epidural injections in the spine, and some nerve blocks and radio frequency that can be used to block pain signals in a specific area of the body. I often get a question about naturopathic remedies, um, certain, you know, vitamins and minerals and therapies like stem cells, things that are not necessarily FDA approved or prescribed in standard Western uh, therapy of medicine. My response when patients ask me about these treatments is always the same. In order for me to recommend it, it has to suffice the following three criteria. Number one, it needs to be safe. Number two, it has to be effective. And number three, it must be affordable. If any treatment does not have one of these three factors on the naturopathic spectrum, um, it is not something I recommend. If it suffices all three, it has my full endorsement. Finally, um, this question that I get a lot, will my pain ever go away? And the simple answer is yes, no, and maybe. Yes, many patients find long lasting relief with multimodal holistic care. That means taking different treatments from the different groups that we had mentioned, um, following with a single provider over a continuous period of time. Many patients find long lasting relief. So yes, pain is real, but so is hope. But I also say no. There are many chronic conditions that cause pain that do not have a cure. Arthritis is a good example of that. However, that does not mean that a person needs to suffer from pain. And so they may have to live with some form of pain, but it doesn't necessarily need to affect their lives. And that's an important point in distinction. And lastly, maybe. We know that self-efficacy, a person's belief in their ability to heal, along with positive thinking, mindset, and motivation, is a strong predictor that a person's pain will go away, that our treatments will succeed, and that they will find relief. But without self-efficacy, that's the maybe. If you don't believe in the treatments and your ability to heal, treating the symptoms becomes a lot more difficult and challenging. So I want to thank you all for your attention. I'll turn uh, the camera over to Dr. Jonathan too. Um, but I would just again like to uh, let you all know um, that I am a pain management specialist at Hackensack Meridian Health. Here's a phone number 551-996-8100 uh, to reach me for new patient appointments. And also uh, feel free to email me my first and last name at hmhn.org uh, for any questions or new patient uh, requests. Thank you. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan Tu. That was a great presentation from Dr. Hoskovici. And kind of extending from his discussion about pain management, I'd like to talk a little bit about rehabilitation in general. Uh, rehabilitation, I think, is a powerful concept which can really enhance your health outcomes. It's a great complement to pain management. And as Dr. Hoskovici has demonstrated, often it is a core component of the treatment plan for those suffering from pain. So I'm director of neurorehabilitation here in the Department of Neurology at Hackensack University Medical Center. I'm also an assistant professor of neurology at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine. 
And so how can a focus on rehabilitation help you? And what I'd like to go over today is that rehabilitation itself is a mindset. Uh, I, I think that uh, a lot of us are already incorporating rehabilitation into our own personal care plans, whether or not we explicitly realize it. But I think that understanding some of the underlying principles uh, behind rehabilitation can really help you maximize your own personal care outcomes, whether it's for pain management or any sort of health condition that you might be uh, having or experiencing. And so when we think about the word rehabilitation, oftentimes in the general population, a few ideas come to mind. Uh, for instance, you know, many of us may think about undergoing physical therapy for some sort of, some sort of uh, orthopedic injury, uh, whether it's an arm injury or a knee injury, uh, with the idea of strengthening muscles and helping restore function to an injured joint or um, whether it be a bone injury or muscle injury or cartilage. And in other cases, we can think of rehabilitation as the kind of therapy that, that we see for children who are experiencing some type of de developmental impairment or language impairment. For instance, we may have speech therapists that help children with some sort of language issue, whether it be a stutter or some other uh, kind of difficulty with expressing themselves. And in other cases, we can think of rehabilitation in the context of substance abuse, that um, those that may have had some health issues related to a long-term history of substance abuse may benefit from inpatient or outpatient rehabilitation. But the concept of rehabilitation is much more broad than that. And, uh, and I, I think that a lot of the care that providers, you know, prescribe or patients receive can potentially fall under the guise of rehabilitation, whether or not we realize it. And when we think about the main categories of healthcare in general, I like to think about three main categories that oftentimes when we think of medicine, we think of treatments that can slow down a disease process or having some disease modifying effect. And on the other hand, when we think of treatments that can reduce the suffering of symptoms such as pain, uh, I think of these often in the context of palliative care, that for instance, if we take a medication, even as simple as over-the-counter Tylenol, that the main goal is to reduce the pain that one is experiencing without necessarily addressing the underlying cause of the pain. And in kind of the third arm of treatment uh, comes the idea of rehabilitation, where rehabilitation aims at maximizing function that may have been impaired due to some sort of health condition or even multiple health conditions. And while it definitely is true that physical therapy and occupational therapy uh, make up a lot of rehabilitation care in practice, many other forms of treatment uh, can fall under the, the umbrella of rehabilitation. So for instance, I myself am wearing glasses, I'm very much nearsighted. I don't think I can survive or drive without my glasses. And whenever I see my eye doctor uh, and he or she is prescribing me a new prescription, the glasses themselves are not correcting my underlying refractive error. However, they're allowing me to function in you know, life, with work, with society. And as a neurologic example, for our patients who are experiencing Parkinson's disease, a mainstay medication that we often prescribe is carbidopa and levodopa, otherwise known as Cinemet. And our, our main goal with Cinemet is often, rather than to slow down the progression of the disease itself, that this medication can improve many of the symptoms that we see with Parkinson's disease, such as the tremor and overall difficulty with movement that many of our patients are experiencing. And when we think about rehabilitation, what, what I think you know, it shares with a lot of Dr. Haskell-Avici's presentation is that it's very much a patient-centered approach, uh, that uh, rehabilitation is very much goal-oriented, that the goals are individualized, individualized to what is important for the patient. And it's very much also a team-based approach to care. Of course, the patient themselves is the most important member of the team. However, an interprofessional approach involving not just physicians, but therapists, 
neuropsychologists, social workers, and many other members are vital in the coordination and execution of the successful rehabilitation uh, plan of care. So when we think about the formal definition of rehabilitation, a lot of these definitions come from the World Health Organization, which is, of course, an internationally recognized institution. And many of our definitions for rehabilitation are, are defined by the WHO. The formal definition is rehabilitation is a set of interventions designed to optimize functioning and to reduce disability in individuals with health conditions in interaction with their environment. And the, uh, the WHO provides a number of examples of instances of rehabilitation, such as modifying home environments for those who have a fall risk, or another example is someone who has cardiovascular disease or heart disease that prescribing exercise for that person can increase their level of functioning. But even for those with mental health conditions such as depression or anxiety, psychological support does also fall within the uh, context of rehabilitation. And I, I think it's important to emphasize rehabilitation. And one of the, the primary reasons I feel this way is that the diagnosis that somebody experiences alone does not tell the full story that just the diagnosis code doesn't really tell us how much this health condition impacts this person's day-to-day -day life, that you are more than your disease. And I, I think that a, a really nice example of this is the condition of cerebral palsy, that um, cerebral palsy, of course, is a somewhat common neurologic condition from birth or early after birth in which an individual has some degree of motor impairment due to an injury to the brain. But the spectrum of cerebral palsy is quite wide that when we look at the scale here at the bottom of my slide, the gross motor functioning classification system, that individuals with cerebral palsy could still be ambulatory, meaning they can still walk, navigate their way up and down stairs with mild symptoms. But people with more severe forms of cerebral palsy may be more restricted to a wheelchair and dependent on others for mobility. This diagram, I think, summarizes rehabilitation in a really nice way. This is part of the WHO's International Classification of Functioning, Disability, and Health. Uh, the framework itself is very well developed and involved, but I, I think this figure is, for many of us, uh, all that's needed to really understand what rehab is all about. And when we take some sort of health condition, it could have multiple layers of disability as seen in the middle of this slide. Uh, at its most basic level, there may be some impairment with a basic biologic function of the human body. And on a higher level, this may lead to limitations in our activities of daily life, whether it's how we brush our teeth or eat our meals or move around or uh, anything of that nature. And at its highest level, there may be some degree of restrictions in our participation with society and the world around us that our health conditions could have an impact on how we drive, how we go to school, how we vote and you know, participate with our civic governments. These health conditions themselves can be influenced by the world around us and by our individual states. And so environmental factors such as, you know, infrastructure of the cities in which we live, local laws, insurance policies can impact our health conditions and personal factors like our own, you know, internal psychological response to our condition, our internal motivations can certainly affect how much our health conditions can impact us. Shown here is a list of what the WHO considers to be 20 of the most um, uh, important conditions that can respond to rehabilitation. And what I've highlighted in bold pertinent to this talk are those that are predominantly uh, manifested pain. So as you see here on this list, back and neck pain actually takes spot number one in terms of conditions that can respond to rehabilitation. Migraine, a very common headache syndrome in neurology, takes number nine. And osteoarthritis takes spot number 13. Um, I'm going to
Okay, I apologize, my, my daughter popped in. So when we think about the specific goals that a person might be interested in during their rehabilitation experience, uh, there, there can be a number of goals that, for instance, when we're undergoing rehabilitation for some sort of orthopedic injury or pain management, our goals may be to minimize pain, to restore or improve the structure of muscles and the structures around the source of pain, uh, to, to reduce pain at its source. And looking at a few neurologic examples, um, for instance, if we have our individuals who have weakness on one side of their body due to some sort of stroke or brain injury, that some goals may be aimed at restoring these impairments as shown in the middle. Uh, here is a child who is undergoing constraint-induced motor therapy in which his left arm is undergoing a restorative approach to, to improving his function, whereas his right arm, which presumptively is unimpaired, has been covered with a cast to really allow him to focus on the impaired left arm. On the other hand, on the left side of the screen is an example of a compensatory strategy where someone who may have had a stroke with left-sided weakness might learn to use their unimpaired right arm to put on a shirt or take off a sweater. And I think what's an important point is that when it comes to rehabilitation, the goal is not merely to return to a status quo of how a person was before that health condition had taken place, but really it's under the understanding that the goal of rehabilitation is to allow a person to live their life to the fullest. Uh, a group uh, based in the United Kingdom back in 2017 had coined this term of ultrabilitation. Um, and the main idea behind this term is that, for instance, if we look at this figure here on the bottom left, that if a person has some baseline level of functioning, they are met with some sort of health condition resulting in an acute change of decreased function, that rather than just simply having a goal of returning to that previous level of function, that person still has a capability to flourish beyond that level of function and to be the best person that person can be. And what I've shown here in this image on the right, uh, there is a, a concept in, in Japanese pottery of kintsugi, which I think is quite appropriate to this idea, uh, that the idea is that if we have some um, bowl or ceramic and that bowl breaks and you know it falls off the shelf and shatters into several pieces, that one approach is not to merely hide the, the, you know, the broken pieces and to try to get it to look how it was before, but to embrace that change, to embrace that part of its history and to really highlight it and potentially make it even more beautiful than it was before the, the break. So a brief word on you know, how do we measure function as healthcare professionals? And there are many ways to go about it, but they're often based on scales. What I've shown here are a few of the more common scales used in research and sometimes in a clinical setting. Um, probably the most important one here is in the middle, the functional independence measure. And on the right over here are, is the section GG scoring system, which is used by Medicare and Medicaid uh, based off of the functional independence measure or FIM. Looking at the FIM in detail, we can see here that in various levels of independence, shall we say, that at the highest level of function that we may not need assistance if we're independent with some sort of task, but there are many shades of gray that um, uh, the assistance that we might need with anything from eating to grooming to moving around within our environment we might be anywhere from a little bit of help to a more higher level of dependence. Here's the FIM in just a little bit more detail at a less busier slide. And as a more graphical illustration of this, if you take a person's ability to you know, transfer from a bed to a wheelchair or to um, you know, navigate their bedroom or their house, we can think of the, you know, a FIM of one being a highest level of dependence that such a person might require two helpers. They might require additional technology to allow them to move around. And at a higher level, 
someone who has a FIM level of five might require just supervision where a helper may be available at standby with hover hands, making sure that that person stays balanced. So there's many shades of gray in what it means to be dependent for care. A lot of times, just as in pain management, we rely on the patients themselves to report what symptoms they're experiencing. So here I've shown on the left, uh, for our patients with concussion, for example, which can be associated with a large number of symptoms, scales like the post-concussion symptom scale can help us quantify these indiv individual symptoms. And over here on the right is the Oswestry Low Back Pain Disability Questionnaire, where patients can inform us with the degree with which their back pain interrupts specific activities of daily living, such as standing or sleeping. Um, these are just two of the items in this questionnaire. And so in summary, what I, what I hope is demonstrated today is that you know, this concept of rehabilitation, it's a very broad concept that's focused on maximizing an individual's functioning uh, in spite of their health condition. Uh, another point, you know, that I, I really hope had been uh, impressed is that a diagnosis alone doesn't tell us the whole story about how much a person's daily, daily life is affected. Both physical and mental health conditions can benefit from rehabilitation care. And I think that knowledge of these rehabilitation principles can really help us enhance our personal health outcomes with whatever condition we're experiencing. So thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate uh, you joining us. My email is similar format to Dr. Hoskalovici. It's my first name, that last name, jonathan.tu at hmhn.org. I'm happy to hear from you anytime. And I myself am based out of Hackensack University Medical Center. However, as part of h, &H we do have multiple centers across the state of New Jersey. And please visit our website at any time to learn more and to find a physician who is uh, can help you with your pain management journey. Thanks very much and take care.